is live from Northwoods and Waters, and we are Northwoods and Waters in the St. Croix Heritage Area. Our goal is to unite the people of the watershed to promote the natural, cultural, and historic resources that we share. Let's see if we'll go to the next one. So we cover a big lot of land, over two states, four sovereign nations, almost uh, 8,000 square miles. And you can just see on the map that we are everywhere, including the area that we're going to be talking about tonight in the Minong area up to like Solon Springs. And yeah, so what are our goals as an organization? We want to create sustainable economic opportunities that are based on the region's heritage, which enhance communities and liv livability and the quality of life in the region instead of um, extracting it. We try to bring something back and try to create a better future, connect the region so that we can preserve and enhance our historical, cultural, and natural resources and also increase the awareness and understanding of our heritage stories and the resources that demonstrate these stories. So that's both for the region's residents and for visitors. And our goal is to become a national heritage area so that we can share our message with more people in a better way. And we need your help to do that. We've already passed um, the national park services and everything that we need from them. They gave us the thumbs up and now we need an active Congress to become a national heritage area. So stay tuned with that. We need your help with that. And without further ado, we get tonight's presentation, the Wisconsin Five Mile Tower Fire. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jonathan Moore to introduce everyone. Good evening and uh, thank you, Sashi, uh, for that introduction. Um, my name is Jonathan Moore. I'm the Cultural Resources Program Manager for the National Park Service on the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. Um, I'll say right up front that the National Park Service does not claim to be the expert on this topic, um, nor do we think it's necessarily like our story to tell um, on our own. Um, but we, we did not want the 45th anniversary of the Five Mile Tower uh, fire to go unnoticed. And so we partnered with um, a lot of partner organizations to sponsor this uh, virtual program tonight, and then um, also a hike on Saturday, which we'll talk more about at the end. Um, and I, I also want to acknowledge that we know many of the foremost experts on this fire, um, and some of the best stories are, you know, rest with, with some of you who are watching, who may have been directly involved uh, in the firefighting efforts or were residents that supported it in another way. And so we hope that during the Q&A, if you have memories or experiences to share that, you'll take that opportunity. Uh, we do want to extend a few uh, thank yous. Um, a huge thank you to North Woods and Waters of the St. Croix Heritage Area for uh, hosting this as part of your live from North Woods and Waters, your monthly program. Uh, and then also thank you to these organizations for their additional support the Gordon Wascott Historical Society, Wild Rivers Conservancy, Friends of the Bird Sanctuary, and Wisconsin DNR. And just a few individuals that I want to uh, thank for sharing their expertise with us. Um, Brian Finstead of the Gordon Wascott Historical Society, uh, Jim Rekitnichen, uh, retired from the Wisconsin DNR, but uh, one of his big contributions of, of many contributions is he did the animation of the fire that will appear in Bill's uh, PowerPoint. And then also uh, Ben Garrett of the Wisconsin DNR, um, who just has the wealth of knowledge about the fire history of Northwestern Wisconsin. Um, and there's, there's many more who have helped, but I, I wanted to make sure I got those names out there at the beginning. Uh, as many of you know, the Five Mile Tower Fire started just north of the Namakagan River 45 years ago this coming Saturday. Over the next 17 hours, the fire consumed an area consuming 13,000 acres and 15 miles long. More than 1,600 people were, were involved in helping control the blaze, including Wisconsin DNR employees, local firefighters, private citizens, and students from local schools. One of those 1,600 people uh, was the superintendent of the Northwood School District, Bill Mathias. And, and he literally wrote uh, the book on the fire and he has generously agreed to speak with us tonight. And so without further ado, here is Bill. 
Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Am I coming through? You are. Okay. Uh, the PowerPoint's coming up here in just a second. I have to thank my son, Jeff Mathias, and my other son, Greg Mathias, for their help in technology. Uh, both of them work online a lot, and this is, uh, they do this all the time. And I haven't done a PowerPoint show before, but online, but here we go. I really thank uh, Jim and many other people that helped me with this, with this PowerPoint show. And uh, what else happened in 77? You know, um, this fire burned uh, 22 square miles. That's not much compared to the watershed of the, of the St. Croix River that we just heard about. But it's the size of Manhattan Island, believe it or not. So Jimmy Carter was president, and, you know, they just uh, raised the, the price of first-class stamps. So they were 13 cents back then. And everybody that worked on the fire was put down for $2.30 an hour. Um, and uh, they got a check after a few months from the DNR. Uh, it took me three years to do the book. At first, the Wisconsin Historical Society turned me down. But after I was able to write a series of articles for the Spooner Advocate, um, thanks to the, the editor, uh, Bill Thornley, uh, who, by the way, was a high school student in Spooner, and he worked on the fire. So he had knowledge of it and passion for it, and he let me write five weeks of articles with photos. Then I took these to the Historical Society the next year, and they says, okay, we'll do the book. So this is dedicated to the approximately 2,000 people who fought this fire. And at the time, it was the largest in 50 years of Wisconsin history. And that I know of, this is unofficial, there's been no fire in Wisconsin that consumed more than uh, 14,000 acres, 13,000 acres. So this could be, this fire might be uh, the biggest one in 90 years. It started right here. Um, John was going to cook some hot dogs. And by the way, they took him to court and he was judged not guilty because he did take precautions. He had a fire ring and he raked some grass away, but it was windy and it jumped in some grass and it went up the hill to those jack pines that you can see and those, those uh, oaks and it started. That year in 77, there was a lot of fires. It was a very dry year. I was telling the gentleman earlier that I live on Bond Lake in the town of Wascott, and at the present time, water is covering 60 feet of sand that was showing in 1977. We had a big beach back then. It was so dry. Five Mile Fire, Brockaway, Saratoga, New Minor Fires that year. So the origin was down there on the X, and you can see the lakes. Um, it was named after the Five Mile Lookout Tower. There was also a little creek called Five Mile Creek. So the DNR names these fires, and that's the reason it got the name Five Mile Fire. The tractors were the 1977 tractors um, with no protection for the drivers. And... Um, older trucks, as you can see, but this was 45 years ago. And they called the plows the sulky plows. So the fire started in that campfire and started burning north. The Nemecoggan River was to the south of it, and Webb Lake was to the west. You can see the Tog Togatuck River up to the north. And you can see the animation of a dozer starting on the right flank. Uh, fires with a southern, with a southern uh, wind uh, tend to go towards the east, the northeast. And that's because of the spin of the earth called the Coriolis effect. So the DNR made special efforts on the right flank as we went up the fire as it burned north. So that wouldn't it wouldn't blow out to the to the west to I mean to the east to the right hand side. It jumped across that trail. 
and uh, the dozers couldn't stop it. And it jumped up another quarter mile. Uh, the planes were going overhead. And something that was improved upon since then was that <clears throat> the airplanes now can communicate directly with the dozer operators. And back then, they didn't have communication with the dozer people. They had communication with the rangers. And they had to run around with their trucks and trying to find a dozer operator to, to pass along information. <clears throat> it was jumping up and it was really going the winds were 16, 17 miles an hour and the humidity was approximately that of the Sahara Desert about 20%, 23% um, and uh, they were, the DNR was putting dozers on both sides of the fire now and they were calling uh, DNR stations from all over from Minong, from Gordon, from Grantsburg, and Webster. Now we're up at the St. Croix River. We thought for sure it would stop there, but it jumped that like it wasn't even there. It was this, now it's 3.18 in the afternoon, and it jumped a half mile ahead. And there's a plow from 1977, a, sil a silky plow with a T6 dozer. Uh, the, the, the plow furrow was approximately the same as they have now. You can see the bottom of that furrow is flat. They shaped the plow that way so that men can walk and women can walk on the bottom of that furrow and fight the fire as it goes. Uh, some of the uh, uh, furrows, the plows had men standing in the back, but some didn't. There's an example of what we saw on the fire. It just wouldn't stop with any roads. It, would, uh, it just jumped right over the roads and the highways. Uh, Bud, Bud Erickson, I, I interviewed Bud. Uh, he got his training in the Navy in World War II, and he was a DNR pilot of a Beechcraft T-34. These were kept at the Shell Lake Airport, and the DNR owned four of them. And these were the planes that that uh, patrolled in the sky and gave directions to the to the uh, rangers. This is the Shell Lake, Shell Lake itself, and you can see the airport down below. <coughs> and Highway 63 is up by that. We can see the water tower. Uh, this this photo is is looking uh, west. So um, it sounded like a freight train when uh, when a Fire is burning in, in heavy pines. Um, it creates its own weather, and it, and, it, and it brings in air. It wants air, so it sucks in air from all sides, and it makes a freight train sound. This is a photo from at least 10 miles away. It's getting to be a, a dusk. And you can see the fire down below. And that's Jim Miller at the DNR showing me the martini wheel. This is before computers. And uh, that wheel was a thing that rangers used to uh, give them ideas on how many tractors and how many men they should, they should call every hour of a fire. And a guy by the name of Martini came up with it. It was kind of like a circular slide rule. Those of you my age can remember slide rules, right? So in the first two hours of the fire, 18 tractor plows were ordered, nine rangers were requested, one large D7 dozer were called. The overhead team was assembled. The overhead means the management team. And they assembled in a field on Highway 77 because there was no building nearby to to be in, they just did it on the spur of the moment. They had to get a management team with radios to get the maps going and to send the people out. The wardens arrived to uh, evacuate the people. My notes show that um, 400 people were evacuated in the fire. The county sheriff squads were mostly used to uh, block the roads and uh, 40 roads were blocked. 
And uh, this exceeded the martini wheel training that the DNR men got by a factor of three. It was moving so fast. It jumped to Totogatik, and now it's uh, getting close to Highway T. The Minong flowage is threatened. All those homes on the, on the, uh, it would be the west side of the flowage, um, would have burned if, um, if we wouldn't have had dozers on the right-hand side of this fire, because like I said, the fire wanted to move to the, to the right. It always wanted to move to the right it, for, for the, because of the spin of the earth. It's like you watch water going down your drain in your, in your tub. That, that happens in a fire. Here's an, here's an example of what the high school kids at Northwood went through for three days to mop up later uh, to put out all the smokes. This is um, the outdoor uh, fire headquarters. Those are back cans on the ground that we, they issued to people. And uh, uh, literally uh, was mentioned 1600, uh, but it's, it's, if you added all the DNR people, it's upwards of 2000 people. And they would drive to this headquarters. You stand in line at a card table and they had a person assigned to get your name and your address. And they say, okay, you stand over there and you, and then they get 10 people to stand over there and you 10 get in this truck and you follow that ranger and go. And that's how it went. People dressed in tennis shoes and jeans and t-shirts, anybody could go fight that fire. And nowadays that's changed drastically. So here we are up near along the Minong Flow H and Sand Lake on the left, big sand and little sand. Uh, some more pictures of the, of the headquarters. Uh, see all the shovels and back hands and uh, hodags and pickaxes that they'd hand out to the people. Uh, this was a photo uh, taken at Highway T um, near the uh, near what's called Pogo's Restaurant now, just west of Pogo's Restaurant. It's near the what's now the Stapasek, the corner store on Highway T. And at this point, the fire was three miles wide. It, it was three miles wide, and it was you can see. The, the, the flames are easily um, 200, maybe 200 feet tall. And that Highway T had a big berm on both sides and power lines. It jumped over T like it wasn't even there. And it spotted ahead a half mile, embers and flames and chunks of wood spotted ahead of T and just kept right on going. And there was a, a really big... Um, controversy about this fire that one of my school board meetings, <clears throat> I was superintendent of Northwood at the time, was packed with about 70 people after the fire was over, criticizing the DNR and criticizing me for putting the kids in danger and all that. But we had everybody signed up and the board was, we had, had approved it and the DNR had approved it. And we just had to explain things that uh, why couldn't we stopped the fire at T, they said. The fire could have been half the size. You could have stopped it at T. And if we'd have put people in danger on Highway T with dozer operators and people, they would have burned to death. You can see the flames. On a crown fire like this, you cannot stop it at the head. You have to pinch it on the sides with dozers until you finally get it to a point. This is John Delameter, the fire boss. <coughs> It crossed the, town, the county line at 609. It traveled seven miles in four hours and 50 minutes. So that's one mile every 41 minutes. Nobody can keep up with that. And if you stood in front of that, you can't stop it. You have to run dozers. And sometimes they ran two or three dozer lines on the sides, plus men and women with back cans and trucks with water to put the edges out. And then you literally have to let it burn um, ahead because it can't be stopped at the head. 
So now the fire is three miles wide, 4,000 acres burned by six, six o'clock. Smoke column was up 10,000 feet. We had people say that um, they saw this, uh, the smoke from Duluth and Superior. Another uh, fire headquarter picture outdoors. So at hour number five, there was 23 DNR tractor plows, two large dozers, 11 rangers, 400 firefighters doing hand labor, hundreds more driving in and signing in at headquarters. Parking was horrendous. They drove in from all directions. The Gordon prison camp crew was there, the DNR fish and game crew, and lots of know-it-all beer drinkers at the roadblocks. And those were the folks that thought the fire could be stopped at Highway T. The DNR had all these dozers parked there, ready to go, these private dozers. There was 31 private dozer operators that were called for this fire. And uh, six National Guard dozers. But they had to wait until they could get them on the sides of the fire. Uh, more ra radio communication. They sent scouts out with radios, and then they were radio back. And then the rangers would go out and talk to the dozers. Because we, not to repeat myself, but the dozer operators now have radio sets and uh, are in complete communication. But back then they didn't. Here we go across this, into Douglas County. It's getting up. Do you see that little lake in the middle up there called Loon Lake? It's getting up near Crystal Lake, Cranberry Lake. Loon Lake split this fire in half. That was a that was a a, a major um, positive thing. And here's another shot of Highway T. You see the sign Highway T. Nine days since the last rain, twenty three percent humidity. Winds were seventeen miles an hour. And we when we hiked today, uh, where the fire ended, um, with Jonathan. And Ben, um, we we mentioned that the fire didn't die down at night. It kept it kept blowing all night long. Usually the the, the uh, winds died down at night, but they didn't on that fire. So all night long it was blowing, blowing um, in uh, eight hundred to whatever thousand degrees. So this is a controversy I talked talk, talked about. Highway T was actually a, a howling, raging fireball. If if you had seen it, you would have believed that language. So the fire gets split by the little lake, Loon Lake. And uh, there's another picture at Highway T. Another photo at Highway T. Another one. See, it? it's, it's over the top. It's crossed. Nobody could stop it. There's just a mass of flames. So finally, it was contained at uh, about 7 a.m. on Sunday morning, burned for 16 hours. And we, we fought on it all night. I myself was on the fire for 56 hours. And uh, many other people were on the fire for as, as long as that. And some of the rangers uh, were on the fire for um, without sleep for days and days. <clears throat> There's a picture, a nighttime picture that you'd see uh, walking with your back can or your shovel. So there was a, I myself was in a truck on a road between Crystal Lake and Cranberry Lake. Um, uh, right where now is called Circle Pines Restaurant and Bar. And the fire was on both sides of the road. And two other men were in the truck with me. It was my own truck. And we had to roll the windows up so our arms didn't get burned. It was that hot. So we turned around and went back out and waited till it was safer to go in. So the fire was narrowed. And um, <coughs> Loon Lake split the fire. And this really helped us. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're at 2.30 in the morning. It's pitch dark except for the, 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 um, the flames. And if you happen to be caught 
uh, happened to be fighting the fire and the fire bypassed you and you were given the job of mop up in the black, there was no light and the flames were gone and you could hardly see and nobody had flashlights and it got cold and a lot of people weren't dressed for the cold. And, uh, and th my reports of my interviews in some of the 130 people I interviewed said how cold they got that night uh, working in the black of the fire after it had bypassed them and gone north. This is our tornado vortex. Um, I've seen a few of these pictures since some, some fires out west. But I have eyewitnesses of two men <coughs> who, got, <coughs> who got caught in a vortex. And, uh, and kids from the Spooner High School. They got caught in a vortex. And uh, the vortex laid down on the ground. And they ran out on grass that was not burned. And all lived to tell about it. But they dropped their their stuff. They they dropped their their back cans and their shovels, and they, they ran out of this. They 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 ran out of the middle of their tornado, and they went back in a few days later because they remembered where it was, and they found their equipment burned in black, and had they had they not run out of this fire tornado they would have uh, lost their lives as it stands it's totally amazing that upwards of 2,000 people fought on this fire and there was nobody nobody even injured a lot one one man um, that I interviewed uh, turned his ankle that's it nobody even went to the hospital and of course nobody died it's just amazing I was so lucky so now we're up near the St. Croix River, near the end of the fire. It's 4 o'clock till 5.30 in the morning. <clears throat> the right hand was stopped. And um, on Saturday, we're going to have that hike up near where the hill property is, where this fire ended. So here's a footprint of the fire. You see how it went towards the uh, northeast? This is Crescious Harbor. It's now called Pogo's. And that's, um, that's near um, a Viewpoint Lodge. That's right behind Blue Viewpoint Lodge. Uh, this is a photo down on the St. Croix River at the end of the fire. See, that's a home light <clears throat> red fire pump. I had one for myself. I uh, bought one up for my protect protection at my house. And it's sucking water out of the St. Croix River. <clears throat> and this is where the fire stopped. The losses uh, back then. Um, 121 structures were saved inside the burn, 63 burned. Now the dozer operators have protection on the sides. There's 43 miles of fire line dug in that 16, 17 hours. And that's the same as a highway crew building a drivable road from Madison to Chainesville in one day or from just imagine 43 miles from anywhere in one day at night around lakes and swamps. And the, the roads are actually drivable by pickup trucks by the next day. The big um, National Guard dozers came up behind and made the road. So it trans transferred into 21st century wildland firefighting. And at this point, my book goes into how things changed and how, and how lots of money got put into it uh, and, uh, every, and many, many changes in technology and uh, new dozers and pumpers and um, common radios, common frequencies, uh, more training. And now you don't get anybody off the street. Anybody going into a fire now has to have safety clothing. You have to almost be a member of a fire department or a, or a, a trained DNR person, or you can't get in. And you have to have your Nomex clothing and your boots and your and your helmet and 
uh, and your safety um, 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 equipment. Um, we have to carry a, I can't think of it right now, where you can crawl into to save yourself on the ground. Can anybody help me there? I forgot the name of it. The air attack is a single engine air track. Beacon. Go ahead. Fire shelter. Yes, fire shelter. Yes. Yeah, you pull them out and you crawl into them if you're threatened. So now we have fire compacts with Minnesota, Ontario, Michigan, and Manitoba. We can get water bombers. We can get uh, seat planes. And now these Cessna spotter planes, the DNR owns, I don't know, 10 or 12 Cessnas. I saw the hangar in Madison. <coughs> and some of them are there and some of them are around the state. And as you probably know that they took down all the water, all the fire towers in the last 10 years. So the five mile tower is gone. The Gordon Tower is still there, but it's not being used. And now they send these, the Cessna planes up and they fly um, patterns around the state. And so you can, it's much more uh, efficient. And from 3000 feet, you can see a fire from a long ways away that you couldn't see from a fire tower. So they close all the fire towers. That's another change. <clears throat> this is an air tanker at the Solon Springs Airport. These guys uh, uh, dust crops, but then they come up and they, they're they hired by the DNR to uh, drop fire retardant on the fire. They have these pumpkin tanks, um, and they put fire retardant in there. And usually the color is blue, so the firefighters can see the stuff coming out of the plane. And these guys are um, daredevils. They come right down to treetop level. Now, these are the planes that are owned by Minnesota and Manitoba and Ontario. <clears throat> I don't believe Wisconsin owns any of these. They scoop up from lakes, double engine. And now I see on California fires and out west, they have these even bigger planes that they've made into tankers. And then helicopters as well. This is our Wascott Fire Department a few years ago. We were we did not exist in 1977. Um, and, uh, Incident Command Center, now with uh, TV sets and radios and all kinds of people that different that have different jobs. And then on the right you see and, and the bottom you see the the they have mobile command centers now. And the DNR has spent lots and lots of time and money to uh, train their personnel on fighting fires with a management team. <clears throat> uh, here's a picture of, uh, of a uh, cabin that probably would not survive a fire. And... Um, That's what it would happen. We saw a lot of this on the Garriman Road fire. This this house here is not going to make it. If there's a fire, that the, the pines will be burning at 800 degrees, and that house will be gone in a matter of minutes. This house will make it, fire-wise. But they're trying to trying to train people to rake the leaves and to get the trees back from your homes. Smokey says we need your help. And that's the end of my show. So, um, any questions? Time for discussion questions? Jeff, can I get out of the PowerPoint now? We'd love to hear your questions if you want to drop them in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask them with your own words. But if you Stop. put them in the chat, I'll read them off. The, uh, the book is available. Um, if you just write write me uh, at P.O. Box 5, Wascott, Wisconsin, and send 20 bucks, and I'll, I'll include the shipping and, and send you the book. Or you can get it from Amazon or the, or the Wisconsin Historical Society. Hi, Bill. Jim McKinnon here. Jim, how are you? Good. Glad to see you and enjoyed your show. 
I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what things are like in this neighborhood nowadays. That the, they were so fortunate that fire avoided major structure losses on all these lakes, because the number of cabins on these lakes now is just crazy. It's like I think Nancy Lake had three hundred probably ten years ago, and the big thing is the the federal programs come up with Firewise, and it's really a good program on protecting structures. And the county has instituted um, making your driveway wide enough so fire trucks can get in and out. So there's they're trying to keep up with things, but there's just so much out there now. And Jim, I don't see your picture. Is your oh, picture I, on here? No. Okay. Um, let's see. But uh, I just thought uh, they did an excellent job. You know that, that you talked about. Uh, the fire being otter shape in your book. And that's what they taught us. If it's like cigar shaped, they're doing a good job of controlling it. If it looks like an egg, they're not doing anything on it usually. Hmm. Uh, Jim was the one that helped me greatly on this PowerPoint show. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Thank you for your input and everything, Jim. I have our first question from Kristen. The question is how um, has the burned area been reforested? A, a lot of it came back naturally, and some has been reforested. In some places, you can't see that there was a fire. It comes mm -hmm. back so fast, especially in the jack pine area. When those cones open up from the heat, there's a place on Three Mile Road that, that um, you know, normally when you plant a, a red pine plantation, you plant about a thousand an acre. And there were, there were places where after this fire went through that there was 5,000 jack pines per acre that grew up with just like a grass field filled with jack pines. So yes, the, it comes back on its own. That must be amazing to see. I can just, I can just imagine, wow. <laughs> Is that right, Jim? Correct. Jim. Um, usually it takes three to five years before the jack pine comes up. In a lot of areas they were planting shortly after the fire had gone through and now you can go out and see a lot of an intermixed growth and just driving down 53 now it's amazing to see how much the red pines are growing up under the plantations where they thinned and I'm not sure exactly what they're going to the plan is for that it's just it looks like a jack pine stand it's just thick thicker than the heck. A hmm. uh, Mosinee paper company owned about 4,500 acres that burned uh, now it's not called Mosinee. They sold to a different company, but they lost uh, 4,500 acres in this fire. And I think they replanted most of that. Hmm. Thank you. Yep. I've got another question from Mary Mack. And their question is, uh, it must be a simple question, but what is the metal box on the back? I don't know exactly what they mean. So if you want to elaborate, Mary Mack, let us know. But... The metal box on the back. The metal box on the back of what? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> Mary Mack, if you want to elaborate, we can um, get that She answer. says of the firefighters. The, probably the back can. Oh, the, the back, back sprayer or something? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> that was... Jim, how many gallons are in there, in those? I can't remember. Oh, five gallons. Five. five? So that's 40 pounds. Eight, that's about eight there. pounds a gallon. So they're carrying around 40 pounds of water. And it's, and they, there's a different name for it, but you, you, uh, you, you, you pump the water out. Water bags. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Matt I see you. How's Matt? <laughs> doing good bill <clears throat> tell us who you are <laughs> philip has a great question too i don't know if you've seen it there sashi but um what was the gordon tower actively monitoring the fire or did they have to evacuate what was the role of the five mile fire and or the and are those two the same the gordon tower fire and the five mile no, the, uh, the, Gordon, uh, the Gordon Tower was not affected, but they might have seen the smoke. Uh, the five mile uh, tower was out 
I don't know, that's probably about eight, nine miles out there, out uh, west. And that was the nearest tower to the start of the fire. That's why they named it the Five Mile Fire, I believe. But these towers back then would triangulate a smoke. If they saw a smoke, they would <clears throat> they would use a system where they would take a compass reading from different towers and they draw a line and then they could radio down <clears throat> where the smoke is from a triangle system. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, pretty yeah. accurate? Matt? <clears throat> I have a question, Jeff. Uh, John Grossman, question. DNR. Could you talk a little bit about, and I got here a little late, so maybe I'm uh, I'm stepping on something you've already done, but could you talk a little bit about the time you took to, and the idea to write the book on this fire? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Actually, it was 30 years after the fire. I, I knew a lot of the rangers, and I was I, I was always interested in fire protection because we have our own uh, forest lands here in Wascott, our family. <clears throat> and then of course I was with the school system. And um, uh, as the years went on, uh, there were big fires in 78, 79 and 80. As the years went on, there was no other fire this big. And I thought, wow, this is, something that I experienced and our kids experienced and 2000 people experienced right here. So it happened right here in the Northwood school district, mostly. And uh, Solon Springs uh, kids and, and, and Spooner kids and Northwood kids and Hayward kids came over and fought on the fire. I thought, why not try a book on it? So I started interviewing Rangers and I got more interested as I interviewed the Rangers that worked on the fire. And I started filling up legal pads and, and, uh, and I went down to the State Historical Society because I went to school in Madison and I was familiar with the, the library there. And uh, <clears throat> I asked them about this and they said, no, they turned me down. So they thought it was, it was just too small a deal and just up in the north and it wouldn't sell any books. But then I, I persisted and I, um, I, I talked to Bill Thornley, the editor of the Spooner Advocate. It turned out, turned out Bill Thornley was in high school uh, at the same time that I was superintendent at Northwood and he was in high school in Spooner and he fought on the fire with a bunch of other Spooner kids. He said, Bill, write all you want. So I said, how many words? He said, don't worry about it. Just send me every week. So I wrote five, 6,000 words a week and sent a whole bunch of pictures and he printed everything. Big full page um, spread in the Spooner Advocate. So I did that for five weeks. And uh, then when that was done, um, uh, I took that down. I had it printed, took that down to the Wisconsin Historical Society and showed them that I could write and the pictures and it was a pretty, huge deal in Northwest Wisconsin and the biggest fire, by the way, in 50 years, they said, okay, let's do it. So the State Historical Society agreed to publish it. It took four or five editors and a lot of three years and it got published. So um, my, my, uh, my fee is a dollar a book, but it's been a labor of love and it's been fun to do. I, I read the book, uh, but what was the publication date? When did you get it out? Oh, uh, let me look. I have it right here. I gave away my copy, so. Um, what is the date? About hmm. 10, 10 years ago or so? Yeah, it was, it was, it was the 30th and it was the 31st or 32nd anniversary, 2010. Okay. 2010. It, just a comment, you may know this, the, uh, this fire and uh, the, the fire event has been studied uh, at a national level uh, quite a bit. It was, uh, it was run in simulation uh, and nationally at, 
at uh, Tucson at the National Advanced Resource and Technology Center. Uh, no it's kidding. A national event. Are you aware of that? No. Uh. -uh. Yeah. Uh, for the for the good job they did, pinching well, it on the side. It was a good job, indeed. <coughs> I mean, a lot of the study of it was. Uh, uh, the, the, the study of decision making over a timeline. And, mm -hmm. and of course, there's some features of fire behavior associated with. So there's been quite a bit of study of it, really. Uh, it, it really is unbelievable to set up a set up a management team in a matter of hours for an incident. Yeah, and this and, this this fire predates the uh, advent of uh, the incident command system. That's how it's run now. But this is still in the era of the large fire organization. Uh, uh -huh. You know, in '77. So it's. It's just prior to that. Anyway, great job on the book and uh, enjoyed your presentation. Well, thanks for the questions. Yeah, Bill, really great. Thank you. Um, I was in fourth grade. My high school brother went. It was uh, called Cumberland. And um, I think how surreal that would be in today's world. But they just got on the bus and went. Do you know how far of a perimeter of high schoolers you, you got uh, any beyond Cumberland? I mean, no, I don't. I didn't know Cumberland was there. Yeah, <laughs> I oh, thought yeah. it was Spooner, Hayward, Solon Springs, and Northwood. Uh, Webster yeah. had some kids there. Yeah, you know, it's I recall. that's uh, ironic because Cumberland was the start of my research on Main Street in Cumberland is uh, the DNR building. Yes, DNR, that I don't know if it's still there. It is the, part time open in the basement. They had the archives. Of this fire and uh that's how i got got started and that's where i got all the information for all the people that worked on the fire i studied the uh i got the payroll records of the pages and pages in the back of the book of these people and and how many hours they worked and that was in cumberland the cumberland office <coughs> well ed forrester ed forrester was one of the rangers on the fire and and he was attached in cumberland did you know uh, no i will send my brother the link to this recording and make sure i get some more information on it and uh if, if i find anything relevant I'll, I'll send it up to you just for your notes oh sure thank you yeah fun and and really great legacy you left here thank you mm -hmm. um uh, one thing that happened in our school was that on on Sunday night, how much how much time do we have? I don't, I, I don't I haven't watched the time. We okay? All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, on Sunday night, the fire was um, stopped at the Saint Croix River, but it was hot as heck in the middle of the fire. They had a ring around it. They had a forty one mile, forty three mile ring around the fire, but it was still burning inside with with outhouses and chicken coops and cabins and and logs and everything else burning. It was still hot and there was no rain in sight. So John Delameter says, call me to the fire headquarters. He says, Bill, I've got probably a thousand men and women that have to go to work tomorrow. And we need to mop this thing up. What are we gonna do? And I thought for a minute and I thought, well, maybe we could use our high school kids. And uh, so I called my principal and I, and we talked it over and we thought that would be doable. And I discussed it with a few school board members on the phone. And I said, I'm gonna cancel high school tomorrow, Monday. And we're gonna tell the kids if, uh, to uh, put on the radio. There's no emails back then. Put on the radio stations, the same stations we use for, for snow days and that, and and late school days that they should come if they want to work on the fire and mop up, they come with a pair of jeans and a good pair of shoes and a, and a, and a cotton shirt and come to work and we'll, we'll provide the food. And then I called all the cooks and I asked them to uh, get in there at five o'clock in the morning if they would. They were very happy to do it and they went in and started making sandwiches because we had coolers and freezers full of everything The you know, the government back then was giving us bologna and peanut butter and honey and cheese and all that so and we had all the bread and we went up we opened a couple of grocery stores at night we got all the bread they had 
and uh, we started making sandwiches. So in the morning, um, I also called the bus drivers and the bus drivers were ready. And we took the high school kids that wanted to go. We ran, we ran a study hall for those that didn't want to go. And we took them out with uh, lunches and cases of milk. Uh, back then, you know, there were, there were no small water bottles. The only water was in big jugs or big jugs of Kool-Aid. So we, we took all cases of milk and sandwiches and we send them out to the fire and we put the kids 10, 10 to a ranger and they went through the black area. And they came back the first day looking like coal miners. And uh, they said, let's do it again. And so we did it for three days. And the kids mopped up that fire for three days. It was like um, citizenship in action. I talked to them today and they're, they're still talking about it. Going on that fire as a high school kid doing the thing for their school district. It almost all burned in our Northwood school district. You know, a little bit in Spooner and a little bit in uh, Solon. And they did a great job. And uh, there's quite some stories of these kids that came back. One girl had her moccasins burned off and and uh, end of the day and barefoot, but she made it. And I still talk to her today. But uh, <clears throat> then on Thursday, took showers, came back to school, and uh, I let them uh, decorate the gym because it was prom week. So they decorated the gym on Thursday and Friday, and we gave them a break that week from, from the pedagogy of education, and they learned, they learned citizenship. So that was one of the things that, that happened after the fire to mop it up with high school kids. And I know that kids from other high schools came up that I wasn't aware of that came up on their own and joined up, joined in. Oh, that's really wonderful. Just um, one last question. Let's see, Tim wants to know how you trained all these high school kids, what the process for that was like. Oh yeah, um, uh, the year before um, I started this um, in 1976, where we would, uh, it was, really dry and, and I recognize that the DNR could use all the help they could get. The Wascott Fire Department did not exist. The Chicago Fire Department did not exist yet. And uh, so I advertised a school for high school kids that would wanna, girls and boys, that would wanna work on a fire crew <coughs> and get paid minimum wage, $2.30 an hour. And I got a whole bunch of them that wanted to. And so we trained them with the DNR on a couple of Saturdays, but no helmets, no Nomex clothes, no boots. Um, but they were trained on, on uh, what to do and how to follow orders and how to carry a back can and shovel. So we had a primary crew and a secondary crew. And if there was a fire, uh, the DNR would call and say, we'd, we'd like to have your crew. And they would usually fit in about 10 or 12, in the primary crew, they'd fit into a van and I had a, two teachers that would take them out and we'd, we'd make an announcement and they'd run out of class and uh, go to their locker and get their boots and their jeans and put them on and run out to the van and go. Uh, I also had permission from the parents for this primary coup to stay all night too if they had to because I knew that was necessary. So it worked, worked fine. I had par uh, parent permission and also school board permission. We had a whole policy on it. But nowadays, it just wouldn't be, it wouldn't work because the insurance companies and the fire departments and the DNR training now requires full Nomex clothing, you know, the helmets and the boots and, and fire training and, and uh, all that. Uh, so this, this citizen, this might have been one of the last citizen fires um, that could take place where anybody could go out and sign your name and get get a shovel and go. Mm -hmm. And you, do, you didn't know when you were coming home either. So that's kind of the story on that. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you for all of your knowledge and everything. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jonathan, who will tell you um, ways to continue to get involved and the hike that's happening this Saturday. So if you wanna to speak to that, Jonathan. Uh, yes, thanks, Sashi. 
Um, yeah, as, as we've heard tonight, the legacy of this fire is still very much with us. Uh, lessons that were learned on this fire still inform how fires are fought in Wisconsin today. And if you know what you're looking for, you can still find evidence, you know, writ large out there on the landscape. Um, Bill, Ben, and I met up today and, and walked one of those plow furrows that, that you can still um, see on the ground. And then, you know, if you look at the age classes of certain trees, there are spots where there's a lot of 45 year old jack pine trees that um, germinated in this fire. And one of the places where you can uh, see a lot of evidence of the fire is Fire Hill. Um, this is the Russell Hill estate that Bill talked about um, on the Upper St. Croix where the fire ended. Um, it was later acquired by the National Park Service um, and is within the park today. Uh, so we're going to be hosting a hike there this Saturday. Uh, it starts at 1.20 p.m., which is the exact time that the, uh, the fire started 45 years ago. Um, if you want to join us for that, meet us at Gordon Dam County Park at 1.20. Um, and be prepared to walk on inclines and uneven terrain. Um, we will plan to do the hike rain or shine, so rain won't bother us. We might even have more firefighters with us if it's raining. Um, but of course, if there's lightning or inclement weather in that way, we probably don't want to be on a walk in the woods. So um, uh, if, you, if there's any doubt if, if it's happening or not, just check the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway Facebook page um, or call our, the St. Croix River Visitor Center. And I will put that phone number in the chat um, along with details of the hike. And so with that, uh, Gratitude to Bill for this wonderful talk. Uh, thank you to all of you for, for joining in on the conversation. And I will hand it back to Sashi. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Bill and Jonathan, for all of your work going into this. I'm just going to share a few more words about Northwoods and Waters, recapping everything. So if you want to learn more about this, you can buy the book. Bill put in a ton of work. And if yeah, just re-promoting it. This is Bill's address again. $20 will get you the book and shipping and handling, so that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> Our next presentation next Tuesday, or next month, fourth Tuesday, May 26th, we want to hear from you. It's open mic night, so send an email with just who you are and what you want to tell us to info at northwoodsandwaters.org. Again, info at northwoodsandwaters.org. Pretty easy to remember. Um, we want to hear your stories. Don't be afraid to tell it. anything that you want. We're here to listen, so don't be shy. Upcoming, again, there's the hike this Saturday, 120. Don't want to miss that. And also in May, um, Wild River Fest from the Wild River Conservancy is May 22nd. It's 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and they have lots of family events, live music, food trucks, um, local drinks, and yeah, it's just going to be a great time. Again, May 22nd, and also the Nibby Walk on the Kinney, that's May 21st. Email us for more information. You know, we just, um, we'll connect you to all the right people. You just have to do an orientation, but that's coming up. That'll be fun. Um, to see other events that are going on, look at Links, which is our free online guide to in-person and virtual events, and that's at Northwoods and Waters Links. So there's tons of things going on there. You can find lots of regional things. If you want to hear more live from Northwoods and Waters, we have a web page at northwoodsandwaters.org um, at, at forward slash live from Northwoods and Waters. We'll post the recording of this video once I edit it onto the web page there. And you can find everything from the last few months and things upcoming. Sign up for the next one. If you want other stories, there's the Northwoods and Waters Storytellers which you can sign to become a storyteller, share your story. If you have a great wealth of information like Bill, Bill would be a great storyteller. And if you want to find a great storyteller, you can go on to the same website, we'll connect you. And that's it. Please stay connected with us. You can see our Facebook and Instagram there. And again, our email info at Northwoods and Waters. And thank you all for coming. It's been a wonderful time. Thank you, especially to Bill and Jonathan again. Um, yeah, we look forward to having you again. Well, thanks for setting this up. It was my pleasure to talk about this again. It's hard to believe 45 years has gone by, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
but thank you so much for all the work you did to document and share the story. You're welcome. Thank you. Nice to have everybody. Time flies when you're having fun, Bill. I know it. It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that, good night, everybody. Nice See ya. Inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, good night. Thank you. Good night.